Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Bari'il halâiqi ecma'in. Nehmeduhu ve neşkuruhu ve nesta'inuhu. Thumma salatu ve selam ala eşrefil enbiya'i vel mursalin. Seyyidina ve nebiyyina Muhammed ve ala alihi tahirin. Ve sahbihil muntecebin. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Lord of here and the hereafter. We seek refuge into Allah and we ask his assistance to protect us from our shortcomings. We convey our greeting and salutation to the Holy Prophet of Islam and his pure progenies. Sisters and brothers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Insha'Allah, all of you are well and keeping safe under the most difficult of circumstances. Welcome to another program from the ICA. Qala Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullah wa salam alayhi, inna al-Hasana wa al-Husayn, sabta hadhi al-Ummah, wa huma min Muhammad ka makan al-aynayn min al-Ra'as, wa amma ana fa ka makan al-yad min al-Badan, وَأَمَّا فَاطِمَا فَكَمَا كَانَ الْقَلْبِ مِنَ الْجَسَدِ This hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatu Allah salam alayhi uses the metaphor of a body assuming that the Holy Prophet is the central piece in the establishment of Islam. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein could be represented as the eyes Amir al muminin can present himself as the hand and Fatima al-Zahra alayha, as the heart of this body, which outlines the importance and the significance, particularly of the holy Fatima al-Zahra, Sayyid uh, Fatima al-Zahra. And since today is, according to a number of traditions, another anniversary or the third group of hadith that they say uh, the anniversary of the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra happened to be today. So we want to dedicate uh, today's conversation to Fatima al-Zahra alayha, and discuss very briefly uh, about her life. Uh, it is in the shortness of time it's nothing more than a scratching of the surface, or as some people say, provide a thumbnail biography of her life, because it, the complexity of her life is such that uh, we will not be able to do justice to it if we wanted to uh, somehow contain everything within the next short period of time, uh, or half an hour or more. To begin to understand Fatima al-Zahra and why her role and her, her existence is so important and critical uh, for Islam and the Muslim community, we really need to start our journey with a brief introduction of the parents, her parents, and the significant role that they played uh, in the formation of Islam, protection of Islam, and development of Islam. Her father doesn't need any description. He's none other than the Holy Prophet himself. Born as an orphan, with his father passing away before his death, before he was born, and his mother later on within a few years of his birth. He is uh, from Quraysh, and the clan of Bani Hashim. And his lineage can be traced back to Prophet Ibrahim والسلام, through his son Ismail. His prophecy officially begins with the first revelation at the age of 40. And uh, with that revelation that became the basis for the holy book the only living miracle, the only li living and uh, viable scripture that we have. Uh, and his life 
with that message, he became uh, the last messenger and the seal of the prophet, and his prophecy changed the course of human history. His, her mother, Fatima al-Zahra's mother, Khadija bint Khwailid, is again from Quraysh, a distance, distant cousin of the Holy Prophet. According to the historians, they claim that Khadija, among all of his wives, was the closest to him based on the clan, because they are all various uh, grandfathers ultimately reached to Qusay ibn Qalab, uh, which is the great, great grandfather of all of these various clans of Quraysh. Her father uh, was a successful uh, businessman in, in, in Mecca, and her mother, Fatima bin Tazaida, was a well-known and recognized figure within the female community of uh, Quraysh. Because of uh, the father's success, she inherited not only the wealth, she inherited a unique acumen that she was able to use and become the most powerful businesswoman in the Jahiliya uh, period before Islam. She was born 15 years before the, uh, the Amal field, which, is, which means she was older than the Holy Prophet by 15 years. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, Surah al fil that we talked about, uh, in the Jahiliya period, there was no such thing as calendars or years that one could say he was born or she was born uh, year 1955 or 45 or something. Major events that took place, people compared their birth or I significant affairs that they had, how many years before that major event, call it a singular event, or how many years after. So Khadija's birth is 15 years before the Amul field, and the Holy Prophet's birth is actually on the same year so she was uh, 15 years older than the Holy Prophet. The story regarding whether Khadija was married before uh, or not, uh, again, you could look at uh, various uh, his, his books of history. There are a number of opinions. There are those who say that Khadija was married twice before she married the Holy Prophet. First, to Abu Hala and Ibn Nabash ibn Zarara, that from him uh, she had two sons. And number two, from Utayq or Atiq ibn Aid al Makhzumi, that she had a son from him. The third opinion says that no, she was not married, and the Holy Prophet was the first husband. The third opinion that no, she was married, and she didn't have any children from the previous marriage. And the children that are attributed to her are related to her. These are nieces from uh, children of, of her sister that she took under her protection. This is neither here nor, nor there. Uh, but certainly with regard, to all historians claim that Khadija at the time of marriage to the Holy Prophet, she was 15 years older, she was 40, and he was 25. There are others who uh, disagree and they say that uh, she was a little bit younger, uh, around 28 or 30. The birth of Fatima al-Zahra, salamu alayha. The, there are different opinions between uh, sh Shia historians and Sunni historians regarding the year of the birth of Fatima al-Zahra. And I briefly will touch upon the reason for this disagreement or differences of opinion. Most of the Sunni scholars consider the year of the birth of Fatima al-Zahra to be five years before proclamation, when the Holy Prophet was 30, 35 years old. And uh, the Shias, on the other hand, disagree, and they say it was five years after proclamation, which makes a difference of about 10 years between the two opinions. Uh, Shias rely 
on stating or asserting the year to be five years after proclamation because they tie or associate the birth of Fatima al Zahra with the story of Mi'raj. Uh, that the Holy Prophet during Mi'raj received a command, whether it was a fruit of heaven or whatever it was, that uh, he was commanded to, uh, once he gets down to, uh, some people say it was an apple, and uh, to be divided between half for Khadija, half for, his, for himself. After that fruit, the conception that took place, Fatima al Zahra was born. So based on the association with the notion of uh, uh, the ascent or the Mi'raj story, it cannot have been before the proclamation. This is why they say it's around five years after Ba'tha, or, or close when the Holy Prophet was around uh, 20, uh, 45 years old. Some people say second year of Ba'tha, other people say those who assert, uh, particularly the Sunni uh, historians, that they say ascension to heaven and Mi'raj was later on close to uh, the uh, migration, then they disagree that somehow the linkage or association between the two stories. This ha has become one of the contesting issues. The reason why there is so much uh, difference and uh, be between the, the, the Sunni sc scholars and the Shia scholars regarding this, uh, the, the age of Fatima al Zahra, I personally believe it's a, for a political reason. Once the Sunni historians began to write the early history of Islam, there was a clear determination to make between Aisha and Fatima, to make Aisha the most the youngest, most beautiful, and most favorite female in the life of the Holy Prophet. And uh, a number of uh, fabrication took place, particularly with regard to her age. Now I'm glad to hear a number of Sunni scholars coming out and contesting the fact that uh, Aisha was around nine years old when she uh, married the Holy Prophet. They say it doesn't fit with our literature and uh, the writings that we have that uh, puts Aisha's birth way before Islam, I mean, proclamation of the Holy Prophet. And as such, we see Fatima has been marginalized, and you see that even in the books of Hadith. Uh, daughter of the Holy Prophet, staying with the Holy Prophet for nearly 18 years or 19 years or 20 years, uh, Bukhari only narrates few Hadith from her, while from Aisha, uh, close to few hundred. And uh, other books. So it the literature that we have and the writings with regard to marginalization or lowering the status of Fatima has political reason that we really don't want at this stage uh, to get into it. There are a huge number or extensive uh, writing regarding the birth of uh, Fatima to Zahra. Certainly, uh, when Khadija married the Holy Prophet, uh, women of Quraysh shunned her, completely marginalized her and ignored her, and she would, they would not associate with her. When the time came to, for uh, the, the childbirth, as it was customary, uh, Khadija wrote or sent uh, s messages to various well-known women to come and be present and give her a, ha a hand. They all refused. They say miraculously a number of heavenly figures appeared. Uh, some people say it was uh, Sayyida Maryam, Asiya, Sarah, the wife of Ibrahim, and few others that were present during the birth of Fatima al Zahra and assisted uh, Khadija. Now, again, you go to the books of history, you see huge amount of literature, and some, sometimes they really go to the extreme trying to explain what, how, who, uh, and a, a unique mythology has been built around that story. If we want to divide the life of Fatima عليها, into different phases, we really need to focus on stage by stage, phase by phase, as she took certain roles and responsibilities during the life of the Holy Prophet. So the first phase 
we call it before migration. The first phase or the first part within this phase is literally from the birth or at least from the age of three or four until the death of Khadija uh, close to year 10 after Hijra, around uh, after uh, proclamation, three years before Hijra, to Frisalem. And the most painful uh, period in which she witnessed how Quraysh dealt with her father uh, disrespectfully. There are occasions in which uh, the Holy Prophet uh, stated in the historical books that the Holy Prophet was praying in the mosque and people come and pour trash or uh, uh, ash or anything on his head as he was praying and the news gets to, the, to Fatima to Zahra and she uh, runs to the mosque, uh, to Masjid al-Haram to clean and comfort her parents to the point uh, that uh, the Holy Prophet gave her the title of Ummu Abiha, the mother. Her love and comfort and assistance was so much that uh, she substituted herself uh, and took up the role of the mother of the Holy Prophet. And after the departure of, the, uh, the, of uh, Sayyid Khadija, which is still we are within the first phase of Fatima al-Zahra's life, she now not only had to comfort the Holy Prophet, by now she is around uh, eight uh, or, or between six to eight years old, uh, comfort the Holy Prophet, she had to play the role and of that, uh, the, uh, that the Holy Prophet lost her mother, the Khadija, the most favored life, uh, wife of the Holy Prophet. So now she, uh, her love for the Holy Prophet she played the two roles as a daughter, as a substitute for her mother. That's the first phase. One thing which I have to state at this stage, we really don't have huge amount of literature existing on the life of the Holy uh, of Fatima Zahra Salam We don't have some kind of a compilation, call it uh, Magnus Opus or whatever, that uh, gives detailed information stage by stage uh, of Fatima's life. What we really have to do is search various books of hadith, various books of uh, history, and try sometimes read between the lines to identify uh, exactly what happened to, uh, to uh, Fatima al Zahra during any of these uh, periods. The next phase in her life that again has to be subdivided is the migration. So if we say that the, the, the role or the, the life of, of Fatima al-Zahra is divided into two major phases, before uh, the, the migration and after the migration. Before the migration early part in which Khadija was still around and she had the protection of her mother and uh, her great uncle, etc., and uh, she played a role. And then after the death and the departure of Khadija, she played a, diff a major role in the life of the Holy Prophet. Migration came, generally speaking, uh, migration opened a new chapter in the life of the early Muslims. Certainly, uh, oppression, persecution, to the degree that existed in Mecca certainly subsided. There were other challenges in form of battles, attack against Medina, but at least during the period under the auspices and the guidance of the Holy Prophet, Muslims began to put into practice and construct what we call the Umm, uh, community of Muslims that now has uh, is going to play a major role as role model for everybody else. So it relieved the Muslim community when it came to torture and everything else. There were other challenges that they, uh, they, uh, they had to deal with. During this period, when it comes to life of Fatima al-Zahra, again, we have to subdivide it between various phases. First phase, between the migration, uh, I mean, at, at the beginning of migration until the marriage 
with, the, with Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu around two years. She participated in the Battle of Badr and in the Battle of Uhud to a degree. And she was active member of the community uh, as any other member of the community during that period. She, uh, in the battle, she, uh, she participated as a as nurse, trying to attend to the wound of the soldiers. And uh, particularly during Uhud, in, in which uh, she uh, was instrumental uh, in protecting the Holy Prophet and attending to his wounds during that battle. During the Battle of Khandaq, the trenches, she was the one that organized food for the soldiers as they were living outside the city and they could not leave those trenches fear that uh, the Quraysh or the Mushrikeen would attack them. She was present during Fathul Makkah, the victory in Mecca. So the first two years uh, before marriage, uh, it, it was quite clear that she was not only active within the household of the Holy Prophet. Uh, she was active as a, uh, somebody who took her social responsibility seriously. After the marriage with Amir al-Mu'mineen, by the way, I don't intend to discuss in detail the issue of marriage because now the story of the marriage and all the details that we have regarding the marriage, how the proposal took place and what was the dowry, uh, how uh, the message was given to Fatima al-Zahra, what did the Holy Prophet do, and how that dowry was spent uh, in attending to the poor and the needy are extensively dealt with in books that we have about marriage in Islam. If you want, uh, because marriage in Islam, they exemplify, they say that the marriage of Holy uh, Fatima al-Zahra and Amir al muminin typifies the ideal marriage. And hence, uh, the uh, extensive literature to uh, talk to Muslims when they want, particularly in the premarital counseling, we try to remind our couples as exactly what are their, ri their, their, their uh, rights and responsibilities within marriage, and we borrow some of these examples from this. So I leave that into a different for a different day that this issue is discussed. But one thing we must say that during this period, she took multi roles. She became literally multifaceted individual, as not only as a mother for her children, as a daughter to the Holy Prophet, as a wife to Amir al Mu'minin, at the same time as educator, teacher, and social activist within the community. And that's what makes her, uh, her, her character is so difficult to be able to what we call dissect and deconstruct in such a small period of time. Because you are at a loss how much you can give to this unique individual as a daughter and the way she behaved to, to, her, to her father. Or as a wife to her husband. Or as a mother to her children. Social activism, how much she cared for the poor and the needy. We have Surat al-insan uh, revealed about their sac sacrifice, the, the, the whole family's sacrifice. So uh, it became, it becomes very difficult for us to be able to give detail. This is why right at the beginning, whatever I say, it is, it's going to be a scratching of the surface and a thumbnail biography. We can then dissect it and say, okay, let's focus on the life of Fatima al-Zahra uh, on this particular issue. What's the role as a daughter towards father or as a mother towards children, as educator, as teacher, as collector of ahadith, uh, or as uh, social activist, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, One thing we really need to be mindful of not only in the Holy Quran, as I pointed out in Khutbah al-Jum'ah uh, yesterday, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to take the Holy Prophet and indirectly Ahlul Bayt as the role model. So she is a role model. And as a role model, we really need to follow her step 
and try to establish a life that at least imitate or emulate her to a degree. We may not be able to fully uh, get to the stage that our life will be in the mirror image of Fatima to Zahra. Uh, but at the same, t uh, but at least to a degree we, we try uh, to, to emulate her life. The short period after the demise of the Holy Prophet, which is the third phase uh, in her life before her martyrdom, is the one that we have to a degree extensive literature about. And this is the, the uh, period in which the Sunni historians hate her for it, and the Shia historians have extensively dealt with and assessed, analyzed her life. It's extremely difficult to imagine uh, the pain that Fatima Zahra went through on the moment that the, the Holy Prophet departed and she, she, she suddenly witnessed the painful experience of the entire fa uh, community literally going back to the uh, Jahiliya mindset. The community that uh, her father, a society that her father, the Holy Prophet, spent so much time and went or, or struggled so much and went through so pain, so much pain, rapidly slipped into the pre-Islamic uh, pre Jahiliya mindset. It was very difficult for Fatima to Zahra. You can detect the pain in some of the prayers that she has about how this society became disrespectful of her position and everything else. Then comes the story of Saqifa, in which uh, they constructed uh, what we call a substitute, an illegitimate substitute uh, un under, from the uh, Fatima's point of view to take over the leadership or the Khilafah or uh, the leadership of the community against the wishes of the Holy Prophet. As a, su as a subsequence to Saqifa came the attack on her house. It's, it's impossible for us to imagine that the body of the Holy Prophet is laying there and uh, some a group, few individuals are trying to attend to its burial and then the rest, they organize some, uh, something Sim, uh, as, as a kind of uh, a revolt and trying to grab power and to neutralize the, uh, the, the Ahlul Bayt. They attack uh, the house of Fatima because that was the place in which the, uh, the, the uh, body of the Holy Prophet lay and Amir al and a number of Sahabas were trying to, uh, to deal with the burial. And the consequence of the attack that Omar kicked the, uh, the door and burned uh, the front of the house uh, was that uh, the pr uh, Fatima was pressed against the wall. That injury to her uh, chest led to miscarriage and ultimately her death a, few mon a month or so later. Witnessing how the new administration systematically went after Fatima and Ahlul Bayt to strip them of all the privileges that they had under the, and, uh, and all, the, all the wealth, all the possession that they had under the Holy Prophet. We have the story of Fadak, uh, the confiscation of Fadak from the Holy Fa uh, from uh, Fatima to Zahra, as well as uh, how they even refused to accept the witnessing of Amir al muminin in favor of Fatima in Fadak. They said, this is only one person. We need more than one. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein are not acceptable because uh, he is, they are uh, minors. And yet, with one hadith from Abu Bakr, th the entire Fadak and inheritance of uh, uh, Fatima and Ahlul Bayt were taken away. And finally comes the, fa the, mas uh, the sermon in Masjid al Nabi. Uh, and this is where the Sunni scholars try to minimize the effect and to a degree marginalize and say nothing about it. While the Shia community, scholars, historians, and so on, they have given huge amount of space to Khutbah al 
because Fatima, despite her pain and the injury that had suffered, took it upon herself to go to the mosque and remind the Muslims of their responsibility. And the outcome and the future outcome of such a plan, uh, uh, this, the new leadership or the new administration's plan that ultimately is going to lead to the demise of Islam or diversion of Islam into some kind of a religion devoid of his spirit. And once it didn't work, I mean, people sought comfort uh, zone that we are not going to do anything about it beyond the f four or five individuals, came the final wasiya and the will by, uh, the whole, by Fatima Tazara to Amir al muminin that when she departs, she did not want anyone that uh, where she considered to be the cause of her pain and uh, her sorrowness to be present during her, uh, her burial. And even scholars today, they say that uh, the fact that we don't have a recognized uh, grave for her is meant to be a political protest of what happened after the Holy Prophet. Even when Omar comes the next day and says that we are going to dig all the places to see where Fatima was buried, Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, said he, she, he's going to defend. And they realized that it's too late now to start uh, a war with, uh, with Ali, uh, and it's better to let it go. So uh, that, uh, it's a condemnation of what happened after. I want to quickly wrap this what is the legacy of Fatima? Certainly, as I said earlier, the, uh, she is one of the most influential figure within the early, early history of Islam and played the major role. Unfortunately, for various reasons, we don't have a huge collection of books that clearly deal with various aspects of her life and stages of her life. We have what we have, a hadith from, the Holy, uh, from Fatima al-Zahra in various books. And these hadith are collected under either in, within the books of hadith and they are to dealing with fiqh, akhlaq, aqaid, fundamental principle, occasionally tafsir, etc., etc. There is a book called Mus'haf Fatima. This is the collection of papers that she put together. Uh, and these are a hadith that she collected from the Holy Prophet directly or the messages that heard from Jibreel. It's called Mus'haf Fatima. And this is, uh, at the moment, according to our tradition, it, the, the, this book or this collection of papers passed from imam to imam and ultimately presently is in the hand of our living imam. Uh, Sharif. Nobody has access to it. Uh, occasionally we see in, in some of the hadith, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, Imam uh, Muhammad al-Baqir and others re making reference to Mas'haf Fatima. One of the issues that are now commonly talked about is Tasbih Fatima al-Zahra which is what we, every person recites and highly recommended by Ahlul Bayt to be recited after the prayer. Salat Fatima al-Zahra, which sometimes uh, is referred to as Salat al-Awwabin, it's a, a very uh, extensive, I mean, a very detailed prayer in which two rak'ah, the first rak'ah of the Hamd is uh, 100 times Surah Al-Qadr, inna anzalnahu fi laylat al-Qadr, then the second rak'ah after Hamd, 100 times Surah Al-Tawheed, Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad. And there are some uh, prayers after this recitation. So after two, two rak'ah, there are some du'as. There are a number of poems related to Fatima al-Zahra in that historians have written it into uh, uh, in, in various books. So what we have uh, particularly at least for the Shias, irrespective of with the male, female within our community, what is critical is for us to emulate the life of Ahlul Bayt, particularly Fatima al-Zahra, and to be mindful 
that our social responsibilities are not at the expense of our family responsibilities and neither the reverse. As a father, you have a responsibility towards your children. As a brother, you have a responsibility towards family members. As a son, you have a responsibility towards your family member. At the same time, there are social responsibilities that one has to deal with. One has to be aware of the marginalized, the poor, the needy, as Fatima Zahra So depending and stood for justice, even with the broken ribs and hurt, she still found it upon uh, uh, herself to go to the mosque and stand up and remind the ummah at that time that they have a responsibility to stand up against injustice in favor of justice. This is part of our responsibility. One thing which I want to state before I finish. Recently, uh, a film, a video, or a clip was presented that a group of people, what I call them fringe within the Shia community, they are trying to organize some kind of uh, uh, video or about life of Fatima al-Zahra, salam alayha, based on a Hollywood style, actors, actresses, etc., etc. And uh, these people were asking people to make contribution up to $15 million. They were saying that they're going to, uh, to, to, uh, to cost for making such a film. But the intention for making the film was not to present Fatima al-Zahra the way it should be. Because this fringe, marginalized uh, group of cult, which I, which I call them cult, they are, from the beginning of their inception, they have done nothing but to divide the Muslim community. So uh, nifaq and fracturing of the Muslim community, trying to bring this sectarian violence and feed into it between the Shias and the Sunnis has been part and parcel of their mission. If this project was to be done by anybody else but these group, I would have supported it. But because it's been, doing, it's been done by these, I would use the metaphor of Masjid al-Dharar, which uh, during the life of the Holy Prophet, a group of munafiqeen built a mosque very close to Medina, trying to fracture the Muslim community and divide them. So the fact that it was a mosque, they thought, well, it's a holy place. The holy prophet, as soon as he realized what it's being done, demolished the mosque and burned it and turned it into a trash site. He clearly states that the intention is not the facade that matters. It's the intention behind the deed. If you are using the name of Fatima al-Zahra, no matter who these people are, whether Shia or not Shia, you are using the name of Fatima al-Zahra to divide the community, then it is nothing but the new Masjid al-Dharar for our community, whether it's supported by one scholar or rejected by the other. Alhamdulillah, a number of scholars rejected it. But our position is the same. Ahlul Bayt worked hard from Amir al muminin until the end, to unify, to bring people together. Any attempt to, dis, uh, to turn the community, to return them into some kind of violent sectarian war and, uh, and uh, differences and dysfunctionality between them has to be rejected completely, whatever the, the medium that they want to use. Well, I stop here. Inshallah, in the future, we may focus on various aspects of Fatima al-Zahra's life. Uh, suffice to say that we really need uh, to step back and reflect on our life to see how, we how closely our life resembles Ahlul Bayt and Fatima al-Zahra, and we follow them in their guidelines and everything else. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.